But if there's one commonality here among those who have spoken so far is you're bullish on LNG for a lot of different reasons, uh, including, you know, it's clean burning. Uh, the events in Japan, certainly, uh, as tragic as they were, have put renewed focus on, on gas as a source. China's reviewing its nuclear uh, plans as well. So a lot of bullishness. But my concern is, and my question is, and you said the yards are full until 2014, what happens post-2014? What next after that? Because if everybody's rushing into the segment, you could find yourself in the same situation you are with VLCCs and so forth. You know, but I think we, we have to remember that all the business we are in is cyclical. And in best cases, like the shipping market, tanker market, we had a good market for 12 years. I think the same will happen in L&D. You will have fantastic money, and then a lot of people will go in, and it's time to find something else to do. Maybe go back to VLCCs even. But Martin. <laughs> Of course, this cyclicality is also a big challenge for, for the suppliers uh, to, the, to the industry. Uh, we have to build capacity to, to the market that is there every day. So to adapt capacity, to adapt technical service capacity, manufacturing capacity and so on, is a challenge for the supplying industry, definitely. Peter, you worry about this. Uh, I actually, what you're hearing out of everyone is that our organizations have to be more agile because there are externalities that are coming in that we can't control. If the oil price is $70, that'll give us one strategy. If the oil price ends up being $150, that'll give us another strategy. What assumption are you making then about oil prices? Closer to 70 We are or staying agile. We are staying agile. That's why we, like, um, like Tor Ulov, have diversified into gas, into oil. We're moving into FPSOs. So we're, we're hedging our bets. And, and the same thing is true of Bergeson. So I think that's the only thing you can do is, is to move where it is. But Torla Ulav is right that capital moves. That's what creates the commodity cycles. First we overbuild, then we underbuild. And uh, that's something that all of us are going to try to make money on. Yeah. yeah, you want to jump in and then show, yeah. I think another thing is that entering the LNG uh, segment is not for everyone. I mean, the, the ships cost $200 million plus, and not every ship owner in the world has capital to, to enter that segment. And a lot, of, a lot of people can enter smaller tankers or smaller bulkers. But I mean, this is a game for the big, big companies. And bank financing is limited. So I think the, uh, the supply side, from that perspective, is, is going to be somewhat contained. Yeah, Peter. I mean, uh, <clears throat> the seminar is addressing both shipping and offshore. And I think what we are all alluding to is that it's very many different markets. We can agree that the tanker market and the dry cargo market doesn't look very promising in the near medium time future. But you have FPSO, you have FSO, you have product tankers, people are ordering product tankers. You have LNG, people are ordering LNG. Uh, there are all kinds of segments in this market. So there's always a segment, supply vessels, offshore drilling rigs. There's always a segment where you can make some money and where people are active. It keeps changing. I think that's an important point. I think it's many niches that appears. And I didn't actually totally agree with your slide where you said shipping had traditionally not been very innovative. That's true, of course, with the bulkers and the tankers, maybe. But if you look at all the different niches that have been developed, and now kind of also how offshore shipping is coming closer, and uh, with uh, also kind of the Arctic opening up, creating new opportunities. And I'm very, uh, I think it's also very fascinating to talk about the ocean space which is much more, and uh, it's so much that is undetected in the ocean space that we don't know, and we don't know what that will create of opportunities and new niches. I don't, I don't think you've seen anything yet compared to how the market's going to differentiate itself. Mm. Everyone talked about product tankers, and you have MRs, and your handies, and your handy maxes, but what I, I agree with you, what, what we're going to see going forward is going to be the same thing you see when you walk into a grocery store in America, and you wonder why there's 20 different kinds of toilet paper. Well, guess what? Shipping bed might as well get used to it. In the same way that all of our uh, telephones are in a whole bunch of different styles, it's still the underlying the same technology, but shipping's going have to get used to that and in doing that they'll get the energy efficiency and the profits that they want. But those who move higher up the value added chain, do they have the greatest chance of survivability? I think so because the Chinese are coming in and commoditizing yeah. the space. I want to talk about that in a minute but Tor, you wanted to add yeah, something here. Uh, maybe I can ask a question to the moderator which is probably one of the key questions here. What is the US going to do? Because the, the, what changed this energy segment a lot was the shale gas, the cheap gas you got hold of in US. And it's a matter of how you monetize that. And you have effectively two alternatives. You can either use it to create labor internally in the US, or you can use it and sell it and effectively create a better trade balance. And that thing will be a very key for how the energy pin thing will pan out. 
I was together with some people last week who actually told me that you now started to export cotton fabrics from Louisiana to China. So you effectively can do it cheaper in the US than you can do it in China. And those kind of trends are very, very important for what we're going to do on the shipping side as well.